المجلة أهلا وسهلا فيكم مشاهدينا بحلقة جديدة من المجلة الماجازين الأسبوعي نتصفح حلقة المجلة لليوم الهندسة الداخلية والمعمارية للأخوين جرين سكاي دايفينج أو القفز بالمضلات هواية أم تهور؟ A new and native beauty أو الجمال الجديد والأصلي عنوان معرض أوكين بالرانوك جاليري لإلقاء الضوء على أعمال الأخوين جرين من أوائل المهندسين ومصممي الديكار بالولايات المتحدة أسس الأخوين شارلز سامنر وهنري ماذر جرين جرين أند جرين أركتكتشر بالعشرينات عشقون للهندسة ساهم بابتكار لأسلوب خاص ضمن حقبة الأمريكان أرتس أند كرافتس موفمنت وهي حركة فنون وحرف برزت بالسنوات الأخيرة من القرن التاسع عشر إلى السنوات الأولى من القرن العشرين تميزت هندسة الأخوين جرين باستخدام المواد الطبيعية المتوفرة بولاية كاليفورنيا وبالعمل اليدوي الفريد وإدخال الحديد المشغول المعروف بالفرفرجة The words new and native are drawn from a citation that was uh, awarded to the Greens by the American Institute of Architects in 1952, um, which called them the formulators of a new and native architecture. And this is really what I think begins to set them apart um, from others. They really were responding very much to the um, geography and the climate of California, um, and they were absorbing the influences that were present there, uh, which were Spanish, Native American, uh, as well as Asian, Japanese, and Chinese, um, but also um, drawing from European traditions, assimilating that into their designs for decorative arts as much as for architecture. These pieces that you see in the exhibition were designed to suit a particular space and to be accompanied by particular pieces of furniture um, that were only for that space in that house. They did not repeat designs outside of those spaces. So their vocabulary, design-wise, is expansive. They had actually experimented with furniture design very early on in their careers. Their earliest training before they went to MIT in Boston was at one of the nation's first manual training schools in St. Louis at Washington University. And there they'd had basic training in um, forge work and woodworking, which served them well in terms of how they understood the basics of um, the construction of the pieces that they would later come to design. I'd say within about 10 years, they were really beginning to design furnishings to, to furnish an entire home. They later came to work with a pair of brothers, the Halls, and they had a great influence on the Green's design and really helped them to achieve the level that we are most familiar with. The Green's were really responding both to the tenets of the arts and crafts movement, which advocated using uh, local materials, found materials. They used a lot of exotic hardwoods for their furnishings. So they were building with both native woods and some exotic hardwoods in some cases, but inlays reflected uh, local flowers and things like that. They believed in um, a German notion called Gesamtkunstwerk which means a total work of art. The idea of the room as a, a, a harmonious whole so that furnishings within a space were tied to each other and tied very exclusively to that space and that house as well as to the surrounding environment. تخطى الأخوين جرين الهندسة الداخلية إلى الهندسة المعمارية حيث بدأوا بتصميم المنازل من الخارج إلى الداخل أشهرهم منزل The Gamble House اللي صورت فيه مشاهد من فيلم Back to the Future عام 1985 هالمنزل اللي كانت تملكه عائلة جامبل صاحبة شركة بروكتر أند جامبل التجارية أدرج عام 1977 على لائحة السجل الوطني للمعالم والمباني التاريخية بالولايات المتحدة These were very habitable houses, the flow of space within the house, the accommodation of indoor-outdoor living, which was very popular in California at the time, is present in all of their houses, and a really um, creative manipulation of light. 
whether it's the number of window openings or the way that they incorporate cross ventilation into the house, but also the use of art glass and light fixtures and windows and so forth. They did accommodate uh, Arroyo stones, which were quarried from the, the local um, dry river bed to use in their walls, and found materials like clinker bricks, which they've become very well known for, at least uh, in Pasadena or more locally, which were rejected um, materials, which they loved for their textural quality and made walls out of them that have become very much identified with arts and crafts in, in that area. Greens executed designs for over 400 pieces of furniture. I and mean, you see the, the softness that's incorporated into every piece of furniture and the very fine sort of hand finishing. I mean, you do understand that these pieces were maybe built with the assistance of powered tools in some cases, and yet very much built by hand and with the careful consideration of a designer who understood how these pieces should be constructed. And so they've all withstood the test of time. السكاي دايفنج او القفص بالمظلات هوايه او تهور انما بعد الفاصل خليكم معنا المجلة اهلا بكم من جديد ومن تابع تصفح المجلة تقريرنا التالي هو عن السكاي دايفنج بدأ استعمال المظلات بالقرن العاشر بعد الميلاد بالصين، إنما أول رسم تخطيطي للمظلة وجد بين رسومات ليوناردو دافنشي اللي بتعود للقرن الخامس عشر بحيث رسم المظلة على شكل هرم. تاريخ الباراشوتينج الحديث أو الهبوط بالمظلات بدأ مع أندري جاك جارنورا اللي نجح بالهبوط بالمظلة من منطاد عام 1797. بعد اختراع الطائرة أصبح من الممكن القفز من مسافة أعلى وبسرعة أكبر وخلال الحربين العالمية الأولى والثانية استخدم الباراشوتينج لإنزال القوات العسكرية ولإنقاذ الطيارين بحال أي عطل بالطائرة إلى جانب دوره ضرورة عسكرية أصبح الباراشوتينج بعد الحرب العالمية الثانية هواية واتخذ اسم سكاي دايفينج من هواة السكاي دايفينج الرئيس الأمريكي السابق جورج بوش الأب اللي احتفل بعيدي ميلاده الخامس والسبعين والثمانين بقفزة بالمظلة وأعاد الكرة بعمر الخمسة وثمانين ويأمل بحياة أطول ليعيدها بعمر التسعين أما أول قفزة له كانت قبل أكثر من نصف قرن خلال الحرب العالمية الثانية عندما أصيب طائرته بأضرار فوق المحيط الهادئ معلومات أكثر بيطلعون عليها جيم كراوش صاحب شركة ويست بوينت سكاي دايفينج المرخصة من اليو اس بي اي أي المنظمة الرسمية للهبوط بالمظلات بالولايات المتحدة. Jim, we're very happy to be here today with you to learn more about skydiving. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's a great day for it. How long have you been doing it? Uh, a little over 16 years now. Just uh, like a lot of people, I think, I had always kind of thought about it, wondered about it. And uh, one night, a friend of mine told me he was going the next day. And um, so I just I said, well, I've always wanted to do it. So I came down with him and went through the ground training and did everything horrible on the first jump. I was. Uh, very angry after I landed, I did so poorly, so I came back the next week and made another one, and that, that hooked me after that. Why do people do it? Um, I think it's, uh, for some people, it's a once in a lifetime. They just want to do it one time so they can say that they've you know, been there and, and they've jumped out of a plane. And for other people, the, uh, that first jump leads to something more. They just feel like it was such a great experience, they want to continue with it, so they'll go on and get finish the training to get licensed and become a, a regular hobby hobbyist skydiver and um, for them it becomes almost a lifestyle just with uh, it's just a whole engrossing encompassing sport for them. And, and what's the process of doing the skydiving like the, from the first jump to becoming a, a professional skydiver? Um, well it's a series of training jumps it usually takes about 18 jumps with a with a skydiving instructor or a skydiving coach to get you through the skills you need. 
Um, and the first license is the USPAA license, the U.S. Parachute Association. Uh, at, you can get that at 25 jumps. And once you're a licensed skydiver, you can jump with other licensed skydiver without any instructor w with you at that point. Really four different ways you can, you can make a first jump. Tandem, which we're going to do today, or accelerated free fall, which is where two instructors hold on to each side of you through the free fall. It's just sort of like training wheels, making sure you're stable. And, uh, or there's a traditional static line, which was how skydiving started years and years ago, where you leave the airplane and your parachute is deployed immediately. Uh, or there's another jump called instructor assisted deployment, where it's sort of like static line, but the instructor uh, opens a parachute for you as you let go of the airplane. There's training before each of those, and uh, with each type of skydive, you learn a little bit about the equipment. You learn how to uh, get in and out of the airplane, and then you learn a free fall position um, and uh, learn about emergency procedures, what to do if the parachute doesn't open correctly, things like that, or how to fix little problems that might come up with the parachute, and then how to fly and land the parachute and get landed back in the, in the landing area. Okay, now you got me a bit concerned. What to do if a parachute doesn't open? Well, that's why we have two. And it's a fairly simple process of just pulling one handle to release the, the first parachute that may not have opened correctly, open, and pulling a second handle that opens the backup reserve parachute. And the reserve parachute is packed very carefully by a certified rigger. Um, so uh, there's very, very, very little chance of having a problem with the second parachute. The instructor actually died after the parachute had opened, so he and his student were flying together, and, and all of a sudden the student noticed that the instructor stopped responding. So the student knew enough about flying the parachute. He uh, got himself landed and administered CPR on the instructor. He was dead from a massive heart attack. Approximately 5,500 feet, he deployed the, uh, he deployed the main chute, and um, at that point, we were talking, I asked him a question and he responded and then I continued to ask him an additional question and uh, there was no response. I guess the Army teaches you just to deal with adversity the best you can. It doesn't matter if it's on a battlefield or if it's at home or if you're 5,500 feet in the air. You know, you do what you got to do and you just, you know, I didn't want to die. You know, and I knew I needed to get to the ground to try and help him. I didn't know how serious it was at that point. I just know he wasn't responsive. Um, you know, and I didn't know until later on once I hit the ground and in fact he had, you know, deceased. It's unusual for something like that to happen and we do put computerized automatic activation devices on the reserve parachutes so that if something were like that to happen to an instructor during the free fall before the parachute was deployed, it would deploy the reserve parachute automatically. And, uh, and then at that point, the student could land under an inflated parachute. How safe is skydiving? Um, it's safer than most people think. Statistically, it's a very, very small percentage. Um, and a great majority of those were licensed skydivers who just simply just didn't either handle their parachute correctly and landed very hard or they, uh, or they just didn't follow standard procedures type of thing. But uh, even student jumps are even more safe than that, much more safe. Um, the dangers are maybe not reacting to uh, a malfunction parachute correctly or opening your parachute too low um, or uh, not landing your parachute correctly and landing instead of landing with the wing level at a slow speed people try to land in a, in a turning uh, descent and, and that picks up the speed greatly and, and you can land very hard that way. When handled correctly it's a very slow soft descent. And what is like your message to people who are thinking about doing this? Um, just do it you know it, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Quit thinking about it and um, you can go to, to USPA's website, USPA.org, and they have a listing of, of um, skydiving centers there and, and um, all over the world and there's no reason to sit and think about it any longer. Talk about skydiving Riyadh Asi and to solve the extreme sport. And the number of the wafiyat in Nidra is not the same as the بحسب آخر الإحصائيات يقتل 30 سكاي دايفر بالولايات المتحدة سنويا أي بنسبة واحد على مئة ألف لذا تحضير بشكل جد واتخذ تدابير السلامة قبل ما نقفز من علو عشر قدم أو ما يتخطى ثلاثة آلاف متر ضروري جدا Don't try this at home I'll see you after the jump
So after we go on the plane, when is the last time we can change our mind? Uh, right before the door comes open. But before that, anyone can change. Before that, mind. anybody can change their mind. Yep. Okay. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. If anything goes wrong, it's going to happen up there. So right now, we're good. Okay. So Mom, Dad, I love you. <laughs> well, hey, are you definitely want to do it now? Yeah, I still, I, just, I can still change my, my mind until we get on the plane, before they open the door. So right. I don't think I'm going to change my mind. But... Corinne, that's what they told you. Dad. Everything changes once we're in the air, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, hey, give me a big thumbs up. I'll see you up the plane, okay? All right. All right, let's start turning back in. Here we go. What do you think about that, Corinne? Woo! Was that awesome or not, huh? Great. Sweet. High five. You did awesome up there. It looked like you were having a good time. Great, Great time. time. Do you want to do it again now? Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. Once you do it once, you can't get enough. <laughs> That's right. مع skydiving ننهي حلقتنا لليوم. لمعلومات أكتر عن المجلة وإكسكلوزيف كونتنت تابعونا على جروب المجلة على الفيسبوك. بوجه شكر لفريق العمل باستوديوهات الحرة واشنطن دي سي اللي ساهمت مساعدتهم بإنجاح البرنامج وبالأخص بيير جراد قبل ما أنهي الحلقة بقدم لكم أبرز صفحات الحلقة القادمة معرض سارجنت أند سي ورسومات جون سينجر سارجنت نوال صوت جزر الكمر بتأمل الحلقة تكون نالت إعجابكم، لملاحظاتكم واقتراحاتكم راسلونا على إيميل البرنامج المجلة الحرة دوت كوم، وأنا بلاقيكم الأسبوع القادم وأكيد رح تكونوا على الموعد. المجلة.